Hello and welcome. My apologies, I was on mute apparently. Um, my name is Angela Washuka. Welcome to NBO Lip Fest, which is presented by BookBank. I'm a founder at BookBank Book Bank Trust, and this festival is anchored in Nairobi's public libraries and is also a celebration of the Macmillan Memorial Library's 90th year. If you're new to the work that we're doing here at BookBank to transform public libraries, please visit bookbank.org to explore a grand vision for these libraries. For now, some house rules, always fun to begin with. Um, your mics will remain muted for the duration of the conversation. This is also a pre-recorded session, and so it will feature a Q&A session at the end of the discussion. But what you could do is um, share your questions online. You can share these on Twitter with the hashtag NBO Litfest, and we'll get to the two panelists. We're also social, um, so you can connect with us in addition to Twitter on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Our um, handle is the book bank and the hashtag, like I said, is NBO Lit Fest. We'd also love your feedback. So pop, some polls will be popping up on your screen at various points during this event. There's likely one now on your screen asking you how you got here. So please share your feedback with us. Uh, we are going to be handing over to um, Shiko Kimeria shortly, who will be in conversation with Nanjala Nyabola. But before we do that, I'd like to thank our funders, Charja World Book Capital and Charja Secret Rousing Trust in London and the Embassy of the Netherlands in Nairobi. We are also partnering with some institutions to bring this programming together, including the British Council, Glasgow Women's Library, Sahifa Jano, Baraza Media Lab, and Paukwa, Asante Misana. So today, the conversation um, will be between Shiko Kimeria and Nanjala Nabola. Nanjala is a writer and researcher based in Nairobi and her work focuses on the intersection between technology, media, and society. She was published in several academic journals, including the African Security Review and the Women's Studies Quarterly, and contributed to numerous edited collections. Nanjala also writes commentary for publications like The Nation, Al Jazeera, The Boston Review, and others. She's the author of Digital Democracy, Analog Politics, How the Internet Era is Transforming Politics in Kenya, which was published by Z Books in 2018, and Traveling While Black, Essays Inspired by Light on the Moon, which was published by Hearst Books in 2020. That book is also available actually on our website, uh, bookbank.org forward slash NBO Litfest. We have a bookshop there, which is a collection of work by all the participants at NBO Litfest. So please support her by buying her book. Chico Kimeria, who she'll be in conversation with, is a longtime contributor to Quartz Africa and has authored almost 40 articles for the site, on topics as wide ranging as the perils of traveling with an African passport to the optimism inspired by Africa's first NFT art collections. She's the author of two novels and has written for a variety of outlets, including African Arguments, OK Africa, and the Africa Report. Chico has a wealth of communication and project management experience, having worked for and served as a communication advisor to Dalberg Advisors, Open Society Initiative of West Africa, and the Africa Agriculture and Trade Investment Fund. She has a Bachelor of Science degree in management from NIT and speaks English, Swahili, and French. Karibuni Sana, um, and the person you also be seeing on your screen is Liz, and she'll be helping us with the sign language interpretation. Enjoy this conversation. Hi, Nanjala. It's so nice to be speaking to you today. I've just been so excited about our discussion. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you, Shiko. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. I think to start us off on this discussion, because I'm sure people are interested to hear what, what are we going to focus on, um, I would like to start us off with a quote from your book, because I think that's just great for, set, for setting the context. So I have here, Traveling Wild Black by Nanjala Nyabola, and I'll move to page 24, where she says, a black woman, a black African woman is almost always at the bottom of whatever constructed hierarchy of value a society has in place. And so when I travel, I am more likely to be viewed as an object of pity than as an object, as an as a target for theft or bribery. So I'll pause there. I'd love to hear your reactions and a bit more on what, what you were thinking as you wrote this. You know, one of the things that's always very weird um, 
for me when I'm overseas is finding all these things that different societies have in common and um, all the things that show up that are that, that are different. And one of the things that's always been in, almost always been in is people, people's shortcuts to understanding what it means to be an African woman is often through the lens of pity. And I think a lot of it has to do with um, how stories about African women get told um, in popular culture, in the media, in the public sphere. And so people always, um, the entry point for a lot of people is, is feeling bad, you know, uh, and, and seeing, you know, wanting to, uh, you know, wanting to help, wanting to save um, African women. And um, whenever I travel, um, it's, it's always just so interesting that especially other African countries, a lot of the times we're consuming information about each other through the lens of, you know, Western media, uh, through the lens of foreign media. So we also treat each other the same way. And it's always like, whenever I go abroad, it's always when I say I'm Kenyan, it's always, oh, are you guys still fighting? Um, are you guys still, you know, whatever kind of thing, the last thing that, the last time that Kenya was in, uh, on uh, France 24, whatever it was, election violence and things like that. So when I was writing about this, I was thinking about um, my experiences, especially, uh, you know, going to North America, Europe, but also in, you know, South Africa and having this reaction of um, that initial reaction of people just enter uh, in the interaction with me starting off from a place of pity. And there must be some reason why you are, you know, people, uh, uh, you are on the road, uh, some other overarching reason and, and not necessarily just that, you know, curiosity of wanting to see what these other parts of the world were like. So I was thinking about that and I was thinking about how African womanhood is constructed in popular culture, is constructed in media cultures and how, yeah, like there's not that richness of personhood. There's not that, you know, diversity of experience. There's not that um, uh, complexity, really. And, and one of the underlying themes of this book is that it's, it's that I wanted to, it to be a complicated book, not necessarily resting on simple narratives or simple um, uh, assumptions. I really, really wanted to tell a complicated uh, uh, story because I think it's one of the things that people really steal from Africans in, in, in written cultures and media cultures is our right to be complicated. Um, so that was the thinking behind uh, uh, that particular sentence, but also just the entire book. Sounds great. And I want to get us to uh, the larger question on, and you've touched a bit on this, but the larger question on the motivation behind writing this book. Because when someone picks up the book, they might think traveling while black, oh, maybe this is She'll tell us all the places she went to and how it was and what it's like traveling as a black person. But the book has so much depth. So you you talk about xenophobia, you talk about refugees, you talk about traveling as a woman, you talk about safety, you even talk about general concerns that some women have when it comes to backpacking under the where will I pee yeah. <laughs> question, things that men wouldn't have to, to, to think about. But you also talk about traveling from a professional ex, uh, experience. So you mentioned like when you're in Haiti. For work or when you went to Palermo to try and understand the humanitarian crisis that was happening. So I'd love to know what was your big motivation? What, why do you think, what, what, what drove you to write such, to write this book and especially to explore the different angles that you did? The main driving force um, uh, was that I had been working in and around refugee migrant protection for a good seven, eight years. Um, I started during the post-election violence in Kenya, working with IDPs in 2007, working with IDPs in Nairobi, um, went to university for it, um, you know, had done all of these things, but I had always had this frustration that whenever I wanted to make the professional commitment that this is what I was going to do, I would encounter these invisible uh, barriers, walls, um, and a lot of it has to do with the way the professional organizations that work with refugees and migrants are there's a racial element to the way the work is structured and the way the work is done that doesn't really get honestly confronted um, in multiple ways. So 
for example, if you were thinking about African uh, uh, migrants and refugees dying in the Mediterranean Sea and you thought to yourself as an African, hey, this is an important issue. I would like to go and, and work you know, on pro providing protection for these people, supporting uh, whatever. Um, you wouldn't be able to do that in Libya. You wouldn't be able to do that in Italy. You wouldn't be able to do that in Spain. You wouldn't be able to do it in Morocco. You wouldn't be able to get in, <laughs> first of all. You know, you wouldn't be able to get in. You wouldn't be able to um, to get to the senior levels of some of these organizations. You would have had to had internship when you were an undergrad, which means you would have had to be able to afford to work for free. None of the internships are in Kenya or in Uganda or in whatever. All of the internships are in Geneva, are in New York, are in whatever. So you wouldn't have been able to get those jobs because you wouldn't have been able to. Uh, a, get a visa that allows you to volunteer, B, you know, the cost, like there were all of these structural things. I would look around and I'd be like, you know, one time I was invited to go because I had, I had a law degree and I had, I, I had at the time I had time and uh, someone I knew from law school who was a commercial lawyer was going to Greece for two weeks to offer free legal assistance to African migrants who, refugees who are in Greece. And she emailed me, she said, because she knew that I had a real passion for the subject. She emailed me and she was like, do you want to come out to Greece with me for two weeks? I said, um, you, and it's, you know, they pay for everything except for your flight and um, your visa. And I said, sure. And, you know, I looked into the process and they were like, there's no way that the Greek um, embassy in Nairobi is going to give me a visa to go and volunteer for two weeks as a lawyer, they would need me to apply for a work visa and then I would have to do all of these other things. And all of these frustrations just kept coming up in multiple, multiple ways. And at the same time, watching this thing unfold whereby Somali Ethiopian people were getting burnt to death in South Africa and people were dying in the Sahara and people were dying in the Mediterranean Sea. And there was always this like, um, there's a crisis in migration that's happening about race and I want to be part of the solution and I can't get an in. And so at the beginning of um, 2020, 2019, when I got the, the book deal, I said to the, to the editor, I need to say goodbye to this shape of this dream. I need to say goodbye to the shape of this dream. I think that I, I, it's time to let it go. It's, it's, you're banging your head against a brick wall. Um, and I wanted the book to be that sort of goodbye um, to the space that I would be leaving it in this form. I think my, the heart for uh, advocacy for refugees will always be there. I think it's something that's always gonna be part of how I do the work, but it's just no longer going to be in the professional um, way that I had envisioned it, um, you know, coming up. And so, that's what the book is, is thinking about, because in my experience, all of these things are connected. All of these things that make it possible for, you know, xenophobia against other Africans in South Africa, in Kenya, all the things that make it possible for people to, Haitians to be bullwhipped, you know, at the border um, in the US for, you know, people from Indonesia to be corralled in these, um, migrant camps in Australia, down to how we get treated when we go to apply for visas at the embassy, how we get treated when we show up at the border, all of those things are connected. And the connecting thread in them is, is race, is racism, and wanting to show through this very broad, sweeping, um, you know, gaze, look, this is the thread that runs through all of these things. And then, but then to do that, I didn't want people to get to the end of the book and think, oh my God, being black is so terrible because it's really not. I love, I love it. And I love being a black woman. I love being an African woman. So there are essays in there that are really just, I hope funny. Um, and I hope, you know, like with the best he had celebratory, like there's, it's not us. We're not the problem. And I wanted yeah. people to get to the end of the book and to get that. We're not the problem. Being Black is great. Being a Black woman is fantastic. Um, but there's something that's happening out there that needs to be addressed. So that's the long-winded answer. <laughs> that's interesting. And you talk about, I'd love to hear more about, especially visas. I think for the listener, 
these might be the main interaction that they've had when they're thinking of traveling because um, maybe many of the listeners have, have tried to travel for just for leisure not really maybe for when they travel for work the company sponsored them so they know the challenges there but travel might be the first place where they've encountered these challenges so i'd love to hear from you about visas including because what i loved about your book was it was essays but it was also the history so i'd love to hear from yeah. you what the history of visas are and you talk about how it it stems from the fear of countries that conquered and invaded us now being scared of us conquering and invading and blackifying or brownifying their 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 country so I, I think it's such an interesting debate there I mean, but seriously seriously think about it the one example that i always give is dominic cummings who was um boris johnson's advisor senior advisor his wife is the granddaughter of the last British governor of Kenya, Evelyn Barry. Barry. Evelyn Barry. Yeah. Oh, I have no yeah. idea. So when we think about, we're not talking about ancient histories. We're talking about fairly recent histories of Europeans traipsing around the world, you know, doing whatever and um, invading and reorganizing and hurting and all of that stuff. It's not ancient history. And um yet in the last 60 years the pathways to legal travel legal migration to the west for non-white people have all but disappeared um the schengen visa is structured in such a way when you look at the rejection rates and the only i think the upside is that because of the way the bureaucracy is structured around a lot of these things, they make the rejection rates the public. Data. Yeah. The data. Um, and so we wonder why it is that a young kid who, you know, has, it's, a, you can, you know, when, when it, when, when European North Americans were doing it, it was exploration. But when young African men have that spirit of curiosity, young African women have that spirit of wanting to see the world, we tell them that the world is closed to them, that you cannot go to South America, you cannot go to Asia, you cannot go, the world is closed to you because exploration is not a thing for people like you. And you look at the numbers, I put in the Canadian numbers because this was one of the ones that really shocked a lot of people to realize how much of a disparity it was, that the average global rejection rate for Canadian student visas is 39%, so about one in every three the rejection rate for Africans is 78%. That's there ridiculous. are some countries where the rejection rate is 100%. 100%. And so Somalia and Somalia, those countries you listed. Mozambique, 100% no rejection rate. So you pay all that money and you get rejected. And, the, and you don't get a refund. You don't get even, you know, like points, frequent flyer points. You applied, you know, the next one will be easier. No, your money is gone. And that's the money, that's not even the money that you spend getting to the embassy, the money that you spend. You know, I was talking to a Sudanese friend um, who was writing about, how, you know, Sudan is huge. And if you wanted to apply yeah. for a student visa, you have to go to Khartoum. So it's the one day trip into Khartoum. It's the hotel. Um, some countries don't have embassies. Um, um, you know, Temi uh, uh, from Nigeria, Temi Tayo, um, has written a really good essay for African arguments about this, that this guy had to, to, from Benin, if you wanted to apply for a UK visa, you had to go to Nigeria, spend the night in Nigeria, did all of that stuff and still had his visa rejected. Yeah. Still had his visa rejected and, and no appeal, no nothing. In 2018, um, I think it was half or uh, just more than half of every single African applicant who tried to go to the African Studies Association conference to the UK had their visas rejected. It's a huge, huge problem. And I think that people walk away from these embassies thinking that something's wrong with them. Yeah. I've been to embassies when, you know, nowadays when they do the interview, unfortunately it's not private. So you're yeah. in the room and you can hear a person being asked, you know, are you gonna come back? How much money do you have in the bank? Da, 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 da. And it's unfortunately, it's usually, you know, other Africans who have been hired for these roles because they're gonna be a little bit more Harder on, harder on each other. Um, and so anyway, the, the, 
you you're sitting there and you're hearing this conversation and then you see the person leaving you know with their shoulders slumped and they think well there must be something wrong with me um and there's nothing wrong with you there's just all of the roads are the world is closing around us and there's a paranoia about arrival from places you know from africa from asia from south america and the the that that's kind of and you're you're kind of a victim of that paranoia. You're kind of people get people a lot of the times these rules are put in place because they can. And yeah. I, I know this is a long-winded answer, but I just want to add one last thing. Um, you saw this happening with the UK regulations on COVID last week, that this week. They banned, they said all African travelers, the initial rule was that no African countries' vaccination certificates would be recognized that if you got vaccinated in Kenya, some people had to get vaccinated again because they, they, this guy who t treated at me and he was saying, you know, I had Sinopharm in UAE and they're telling me they don't recognize Sinopharm. So I had to get vaccinated again. I've had four vaccines. Oh my it's God, like, that's so ridiculous. It's not, there's, there, you know, you look at the policy and you look at the facts, it has not, it's not grounded in, in facts. It's because they can. It's because who's going to stick up for the African traveler? Who's going to, yeah. is the African Union going to speak up for our uh, boys and girls who are dying in the maternity? They haven't so far. Are they going to speak up for Haitians who are being beaten and, and nobody's speaking up for them the way that they need to be defended? And so these are some of the issues that I wanted to really highlight to people that I could write you a, a great story about how I was at the border and uh, speak about myself specifically but i wanted people to read this and realize this is a systemic issue and i can save myself but it won't fix the problem and you can save yourself and it won't fix the problem the solution comes from us thinking collectively yeah. what is the world that we're trying to build and how do we fix that together and i think what you're saying what you're saying is also quite it's sombering but also so depressing because so you've said the world has closed up and who knows what it will look like after COVID, but the expectation is that it will even be much worse because it was already difficult for people with certain types of passports to get access to the West. And now you layer that with this vaccine you're taking, we're not accepting this country of yours, you've not even vaccinated X percent of your population, so we won't let you in. So it just you can just imagine it's going to get more and more closed up. So that's now when we're talking about the West. But I want us now to even move to uh, a, a depressing, a, a even more kind of like saddening state because what are we seeing when we come to inter-Africa travel, but also belonging, you've talked about this quite a bit about belonging in countries. So you talked about like the Sudanese population yeah. in Kenya, the Somali population in Kenya, different groups of people who even in Africa and in their own countries, they don't belong. You've talked yeah. about xenophobia in South Africa where Africans whose countries really try to help um, South Africa during apartheid and now you know, being told that you're the ones who have come and destroyed, that you're taking our jobs and so on. So I'd love to hear more about how are we as Africans, is it, is it, it's crap traveling to the West as an African, but what is it looking like for Africans traveling in Africa, for Africans trying to belong in a country that's giving them problems accepting them as citizens? Yeah, I mean, Chika, you, you're a traveler as well, so you know this, that um, when it's good, it's really good. <laughs> when it's good, it's so good. And then when it's not good, it's worse in some ways. Yes. Um, I really wanted African, you know, when I was writing the book in my head, I was writing for African women. Like I was thinking about African women and having a conversation with African women. Because um, I really want to see more African women like you, you know, like just traveling on the continent and trying to talk to people and see people and, 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 you know, we just need to, we need to, I think as part of um, demanding our own space for, complex, for complexity and for richness, like we just need to travel more on the continent. I think, like I said, it's a complete mixed bag. You have countries like uh, Rwanda, Ethiopia before the war, um, Senegal, you know, just opening up their borders and saying, Ghana, you know, come, just come, come yeah. um, 90 days, 30 days, because most people, that's what they want. They just want 90 days, 30 days, um, uh, be a foreigner, be a tourist, but also not be um, alienated, right? There's an alienation that happens when we when we travel to other places that doesn't really happen when you're traveling um, 
between African countries. So there is that. Um, but then when, like I said, you know, when it's bad, it's really bad. Um, yeah. If you are a Somali person living in Kenya, you're going to have an experience of Kenya that is very different from a Rwandan person who will experience Kenya. And I also wanted to, to be honest about that because I was in Kenya. You remember when we had the, um, uh, I think it was in 2015, 2016, Kasarani, when they rounded up uh, Somali people and put them in Kasarani. Yeah. And um, the context that makes that possible, I wanted us to have an honest reckoning with the context that makes that possible. I wanted South Africans to have an honest reckoning with the context that makes these every two years, you know, someone is burning uh, Somali shops, Ethiopian shops. Like I wanted us to have an honest reckoning with that because I think there's this idealized image of Africans in Africa as being like all great all the time. And I just really wanted to sit in that sort of assumption and different directions and be like, is this actually true? Is it untrue? Like, is it completely untrue? And, and where I ended up was it's mixed. Sometimes it's fantastic. I always have a great time in Senegal. I always have a great time. I, when I was in uh, the DRC in Goma, I had a great time in Goma. I, you know, but then I've had really difficult experiences in Africa as well. And Togo, I had a really difficult time in Togo. And, and that's what I want people to get from that, that um, I don't like this idea of, what is the word I'm looking for? That Africa is this big solid uh, block of nondescript, you know, everything is always identical. I wanted people to really, if there was anything that people will conclude from reading those essays is to look back and say, hey, it's really complicated. Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah, and, and I'll, add, I'll add two anecdotes. So in 2014, I was backpacking through, I took a solo trip through, um, to, it was through Ivory Coast, Togo, Benin, Burkina Faso. And I remember I was getting my visas in Ivory Coast and the process was a nightmare. I had a, a friend, an Ivorian friend and her Burkina Bay boyfriend who are helping me do the process. I think I went to the Burkina Bay embassy five times and every time it was just one stupid request after another. Another. Other times mm -hmm. they asked me, you as a Kenyan, why are you going to Burkina Faso? Mm -hmm. It was so ridiculous. And finally one time my friend, my boyfriend friend, she got so mad at the embassy and she yelled, she said, Thomas Sankara ne pa mo pusa. Like Thomas Sankara oh. did not die for this. And I said, I, will, I know, I said, I will never get a visa at this rate. But anyway, finally I got a visa. And then as, I, as you said, when you go to places, I went to Burkina Faso and People were so nice. The so whole nice. Time. Yeah, they're the nicest <laughs> people ever. They were yeah. like, what? They're from Kenya. You came yeah. to our country just to visit, like not yeah. for humanitarian. I said, yeah, just to visit. The guy I stayed with, I couch surfed. I, he had like maybe 700 people who had stayed with him according to like couch surfing ranking. He said, I was the first African. This was in Bobo Jalaso. He said, I was the first African he'd ever had stay with him. So I wondered, like our interaction with immigration makes it so bad. And then you go to the countries and you have a good experience and you wonder why are we treating yeah. each other like this? Why? Why? I mean, the, that's absolutely right. I had exactly the same experience with Burkina Faso actually because I got my Burkina visa in Togo and it was the same thing. It's like, come back tomorrow, bring this back, come back yeah. tomorrow, bring this. And I'm like, it's a seven day trip. Like, what you, <laughs> it's you, not like that here's serious. my return ticket. It's not that serious. And then from the moment I got on the bus, it was a completely different, like, oh my God, you're from Kenya. I've never met a Kenyan before. You have to come to my house. You have to come and eat at my house. I, I didn't buy food. The entire time I was in Ouagadou, I didn't so buy nice. any food. It's like, no, 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 you have to come and have breakfast with us. No, no, she's have breakfast with us. She'll come to your house tomorrow. And I was like, okay, wait, you guys don't even know me. You know, as a Kenyan, as a Nairobian, you're like, eh. You wouldn't eat food from strangers. <laughs> you wouldn't eat food from strangers. <laughs> so it's like you have to suspend the Nairobian part of your head. And you're, like, okay. <laughs> you're not in Nairobi anymore. You're not in Nairobi anymore. But it's, <laughs> it's exactly that. It's that it's so, it's often so different. You know, I would say the same thing about South Africa in, in many ways that when you, 
and think about just the process of the visa all the way until the airport, it's so demoralizing. It's so demoralizing. And then, you know, for me, especially in Johannesburg, I always have a really good time in Johannesburg because I think yeah. Josie has just such an amazing vibe and amazing energy, but it's complicated. It's not always just going to be one thing. I think, um, how, how do we make space for people to actually get to the good parts? I think it's something that as Africans, people who are in the government, people who are in the bureaucracy really have to start thinking about, even when you think about like when you land in Kenya, right? And you, the immigration lines, and it's like, it's always like, why are the people who are applying for visas being treated better than the rest of us who are in the Comesa line, yeah. in the ESC line and the whatever? There's something about the way in which these logics just become accepted. This is, yeah. you know, how we treat each other because this is how Western countries treat us. Yeah. Um, that I think people just need to cut it out, basically. I, I know with five minutes to go, I would love us to switch uh, to something else you talk about, which is images. So two parts to this question. One is, well, uh, uh, one you given uh, the story about how Alan Kuti and his brother and their bodies being found at the Turkish beach those pictures are so that picture is so depressing. But how that was what was needed for people to say it's terrible that boats, ships are being sent back with migrants who are so desperate, not migrants, actually refugees who are so desperate and they're drowning in the sea. And this is why this little boy has to had to die this way. He didn't have to die that way. So you talk about such images. You also talk about images that come from terror attacks and how those are used. So that's one part of the images question. But the second part is a bit more positive. It's kind of like the images you've seen and then the stereotypes that have been behind them when you've traveled how have this been dispelled so mm. like some of your positive africa travel stories or even positive stories of how you ended up in palermo and you worried that people would be racist but no one really cared oh about it so yeah. yeah so let's discuss images images and travel well, and the importance of them look uh, with the alan kurdi um photographs look at what happens what's happening in haiti now with the haitian refugees crossing a lot of people might not realize that haitians cross the the gulf the florida gulf to get to that's how they get to um a lot mexico because haiti, haiti is an island so they get to mexico that's how they get to to florida exactly the same context you know desperate people there's been an earthquake there's been an assassination of the president there's a pandemic desperate people putting their kids on a boat you know uh Warson Shira, nobody puts their kids on the water unless the water is safer than the land and do that, and then they get horse whipped, you know, whipped on the uh, like slaves. Uh, those pictures, like those slaves. Like images of slaves. Yeah, but you see, what people don't realize is those pictures were part of a whole series of months of these arrivals happening. So the pictures did what was necessary to get people to pay attention to this crisis, because the crisis had been going on. And nobody was really in the US, especially, was really paying attention to, unless you were paying attention to Haitian, like people who work with Haitian refugees, people who work with Haitian migrants generally knew. But if you were watching Haitian news, you knew. But ordinary people had no idea that this was happening. So it got everybody's attention. It got the Biden government, it embarrassed them, it got them to change their policy, um, it got them to take a step back. And then everybody's attention moved on. And now Haitians are still arriving and there's no protection and there's you know, less access because people don't want images like that to get out again. So I really wanted to that essay just to really underscore to people that we need to think about this stuff a little bit more critically. Um, and I, it's one of those ones that I wrote and I said it multiple times in the essay, I don't have the answer for this one. I just know that it's a pattern that needs to be paid attention to, that people are drowning and dying and, and Gulf of Mexico, Mediterranean Sea, South Asian Sea, like right now, there are thousands of people who are on the move on these bodies of water and there's no attention being paid to them, not to mention the people who are on the move on the land until there's a crisis like this with an alien Kuri kind of uh, uh, image that reminds us that the people who are doing this, who are taking these risks, who are vulnerable are, are human beings just like the rest of us. So um, I think images can be very powerful. I think images can center our attention and focus our attention my concern is that people become desensitized um, to images that over time you stop, you know, like I gave the example of the, the South Sudan war, over time you stop being shocked at 
the a scale of death and then it just becomes something that happens over there and from an advocacy perspective it's like why well, you know how, what am i left with how do i tell stories um, in a way that moves people to action um so that was one of that um in terms of images that have changed me i feel like the haitian cases I think I write about how my experience of Haiti changed me, fundamentally changed me, because I went into Haiti with the, the image of Haiti that's in the pop, you know, Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. Like people, it's like now in, in, in news, that's Haiti's name. It's not just Haiti, it's Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. That's the name yeah. of the country. And it was like, yeah, I was like, this place is amazing. These people are amazing. Um, the food is amazing. The culture is fantastic. The it's difficult place. I'm not going to paper over the fact that it is a difficult place, and and there was a lot of difficulty. But um, the Haiti that's in the popular culture is not the complete story. And I love that social media is helping Haitians tell a different side of the story, which is we didn't do this to ourselves. Yeah. We didn't wake up one morning and decide that we were going to destroy our country. This is what it means to be the weakest country in the shadow of the most powerful empire in the world. Um, and yeah, I think if people saw, I took photographs and I talked about it, you know, I took a lot of photographs in Haiti and I would put them on, on my Facebook account and my friends would be like, that's Haiti? Like, yeah, Haiti is a Caribbean island. The beaches are stunning. The, yeah. the uh, street art is out of this world. The you know, like, people are like, oh, I didn't expect that. You know, yeah. I skating, I went to the uh, main square and I went to Carnival and people were dancing. And I was, people were like, oh, those people are happy. I didn't, I would <laughs> never have put that together. I'm like, yeah, they're human beings. Yeah. Um, and it's an amazing place. And I think that's it. And like I said, I really had African women in mind when I was writing this book, because I, I feel like if there's, we all benefit so much from people thinking about our countries differently that I hope that we can also do the same for other people. I mean, and, and I, I think you know this, um, you know, you travel a lot, so you know this, how Africa is so much more, so much more than, you know, when I you tell people I'm going backpacking in Burkina Faso, they're like, why? <laughs> oh, there was, there was a coup there. Yeah, in 1987. <laughs> it's been a couple of years, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I would say for, for sure, the images that I have in my mind of Haiti are so different from the images yeah. that are produced about Haiti. And I think one thing you say that's so interesting now is just the fact that how you also see, and I think that's why a book like this is so important, hearing the perspective of a Black African woman, because also how you see these countries, what will be written on Lonely Planet is essentially written by white men. So they'll say this place is super dangerous, but this other place is okay. And they're saying that place is okay because there's other you know white people there. But your experience as an African, some places you will get by a bit easier and you will understand the nuances. And you might look at somewhere and say, yes, this part of town is rough, but Nairobi too has its you know, it's dangerous power sports. This place is known that it's more dangerous. People are friendly here, people are kind, and all those things I think are best seen from your perspective as a black African woman who's traveling and who comes from places that have been stereotyped before. Because it makes me think uh, when you're saying how it was Haiti was surprising to people. I had the same experience in Comoros. All I knew about Comoros before going was Comoros is one of the poorest countries on the continent. Comoros is beautiful. Comorian people are so kind. Comoros looks like seashells. I've never been to seashells, but when you see all these pictures of exotic yeah. beautiful islands, mm -hmm. that's what Comoros looks like. But all you ever hear about Comoros is coups, poverty, they're always ranking the worst on indicators, and I needed to go there myself to see that. Yeah, this and part of the country. problem with Comoros is, is it's always compared to Mayotte. It's always like, oh, but the place that stayed French is so you know bougie and whatever and so all of these people don't have and it's always that comparison and like you said yeah. there's there's you you're not like i'm not going to um this place these islands to go buy things that you can get in paris i'm going to experience a culture that has people or a vibe that's been cultivated over time but that's all whenever you read the comoros it's always in the context of oh yeah but mayotte um they never left france and look at 
how they have all of these markers of Frenchness. And so they must be better than the people who stayed. And I just, I just, I want us to really have also our own spaces to write yeah. about travel and to write about what it is to be a Kenyan woman in the Comoros and to be a Kenyan woman in Burkina Faso, to be a Senegalese woman in Rwanda. Um, there's a friend of mine who's doing a fantastic magazine off too. I don't know if you've heard about it, Liz Gummi. Um, and she basically, every edition is a different African city, but it's written entirely by local um, uh, writers, photographers and things like that. So she's done two editions so far, uh, Accra and uh, Kinshasa. And Kinshasa, especially, because I'd been to Kinshasa um, a number of years ago. Um, Kinshasa is another one of those. Like it's, a, it's not an easy town by any measure, but the way people describe kin, you're like, as a Nairobian, if you, you, it feels familiar because you're like, yeah, Nairobi's hard, but Nairobi is also, you know, Sanford's at two in the morning after you've been on the raid. Nairobi is also, you know, the Nairobi National Park. Nairobi is also walking through Karura Forest in the afternoon. Nairobi is also, you know, uh, uh, all of these old buildings. It's the Macmillan Library. Um, you know, it's all of these. I love my favorite thing in Nairobi right now is on Sunday afternoon when all of those uh, kids are, I mean, it's a sign of something else because I feel it's also a sign that there's no public spaces left in yeah. a lot of places. They were always see, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But you always see these skateboarders and um, people taking content for their IGs. So they dress up to the nines and they just are walking around the CBD taking pictures and, and being photographed. And I love that. You, it's, it's so amazing to be in Nairobi on a Sunday afternoon. And I feel like now that I've said it, people are gonna ruin it. Please don't ruin it. Um, it's also a symptom, obviously, that there's no public spaces left in uh, uh, much of the city. But now that they've closed the parks for three months, where are people supposed to gather? Like we have almost no public space left. But anyway, the story is basically that Liz is trying to do this, is trying to put this series to kind of speak back to this paradigm of travel writing and be like, actually, here is what travel writing looks like when it's written by the people who are from the place. This is what they want you to know about themselves. Okay. Beautifully photographed, beautifully um, laid out and more. I just want to see more of that. And I, 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 as a traveler, I want that's those are the people who I want to hear to tell me, okay, you're coming to Accra. Let me tell you where you need to go and and do this. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. And I know we're out of time. So before uh, before just ending the conversation, I want you very quickly to tell me your top three travel destinations. And for each, oh just a gosh. sentence. <laughs> just a sentence. Did you say this place because this, this place because this, this place because this? Then we'll head over to Q and A. Ah, uh, you're really putting me on the spot. <laughs> uh, no pressure, but you have one minute. <laughs> my favorite place to date is the last place that I traveled to, which is Northern Kenya. Um, I went to Sibiloi National Park by motorcycle. I and saw. it was one of the best things that I've ever done in my life. Um, so right now, that's the because it was the most recent. Um, number two, I would have to say, um, Ansira Bay in Madagascar. It's in the middle of the island and there's a lake called Lac Chitivia. And Lac Chitivia is like Lake Kivu. It's also a, one of those lakes where every couple of years there's a gas explosion and then it kills everything off and then life starts again, but it is one of the most clearest lakes I've ever seen in my life. And going diving, uh, um, in, <laughs> <laughs> in uh, luxury trivia, yeah. amazing. I think Ansira Bay and the food, Mad Madagascar, where that there's amazing. food. Oh my God. And the rum. Oh, <laughs> the rum or I don't say. I mean, honestly, if I if I wasn't, I would write a whole book about Madagascar <laughs> just based on the rum. Um, but Madagascar in general. I think yeah. everybody should try and get to Madagascar it's, at one point. I agree. Um, 
And the third place, I would say Mexico City. Ah. Mexico City is amazing. History, culture, food. Uh, Mexico is so much more than how it is represented in popular culture. Um, it's one of the most diverse countries in the world. It's got one of the most fascinating histories and Mexico City is where so much of this stuff comes together, just like any other capital. So my third choice would be Mexico City. Nice. Thank you so much. So now we'll head over to Q&A. Uh, I think you might be getting questions through social media, if I'm not wrong. Let's see what's come through our social media. Uh, I don't see anything yet on my end. It's okay. Any, anything on your end? I guess we didn't get any questions. Okay, so great. Thank you so much. Uh, and before we wind down, I just want to, and before we conclude this session, I'd like to thank the people that made this event possible. Uh, Sharjah World Bank Capital, Sigrid Rousing Trust, the Embassy of the Netherlands in Nairobi, and all of the wonderful colleagues at both bank who have worked for months to deliver this festival. So thank you so much, Nanjala, for sharing this thank with you. for sharing your experiences with us. It's been such an honor and such a joy. It's always amazing speaking to you. <laughs> and don't take it for granted. Uh, Asante Nisana to our audience uh, for logging in and conversing with us. And we hope you enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.